Farmers themselves are starting to see trends. They're responding. While we're seeing changes in climate, we're also seeing farmers adapt. Farmers have growing concerns about the impacts of changing temperatures and precipitation patterns on farm profitability. Unless people are adaptable, and unless people can think ahead, you're putting yourself in a pretty serious position. Many are looking to reduce these impacts through management changes or implementing new technologies. This is referred to as climate change adaptation. Hi, my name is David Schmidt and I'm an agricultural engineer at the University of Minnesota and regional coordinator for the Animal Agriculture in a Changing Climate Project. My father grew up on a farm and remembers well the Dust Bowl, the Great Depression and working in the field with horses. In this photo, my father is the one sitting between his sisters and riding with his grandparents in a horse-drawn buggy. Here's my father, 85 years later, touring a new swine gestation barn, complete with a geothermal cooling system for the sows. Agriculture has changed significantly in his lifetime. Some changes have been driven by science and technology, developments in diet, genetics, feeding, buildings, equipment, and business structure, all resulting in producing more with less. Other changes have been driven by policy or regulations to make our food supply more safe and secure. World population growth, water availability, water quality, consumer demands, and concerns about agricultural pollution will likely accelerate changes in agricultural production. This will be a challenge for farmers across the globe. In addition, in many geographic areas, farmers will be challenged with significant changes in climate. In this lesson on adaptation to climate change, we will be discussing both reactive adaptation and anticipatory adaptation. Reactive adaptation refers to the short-term adjustments that farmers make in response to current climate conditions. Anticipatory adaptation includes any long-term planning and changes made as a result of predicted climate changes. Both are important. And farmers are already adapting. So you see farmers that are planting earlier, that are um, relying on um, larger equipment to be able to get into the field quicker because their planting windows are shorter and their seasons, you know, springs in particular have been wet across the Midwest and Northeast. Um, we've seen farmers that are um, uh, going back and installing more tile drainage and increasing drainage to, to deal with these wet conditions. And so while we're seeing changes in climate, we're also seeing farmers adapt to what they're seeing on the ground. Now that adaptation so far, that adaptation has been reactive. Farmers are responding to what they're seeing on the ground, what they've seen over the last three to five seasons and trying to plan accordingly. And that's working for now. But as we look forward, um, we're going to see an acceleration of climate change. That's what all of the, the analysis is showing is that the trends that we've been seeing, which have been about 0.2 degrees of warming per decade, um, we expect that to increase over the next century, where by the middle of the century, we could be seeing 0.6 to 0.8 degrees of warming per decade. And at that point, farmers are gonna have trouble keeping up if we just rely on reactive adaptation. We will be discussing adaptation strategies, reactive and anticipatory, through the lens of a climate audit. We will divide the farm into four segments to help organize the audit. They are farm inputs, animal production, logistics, and farm exports. Some adaptation strategies may be short-term and will affect the farm's current management practices and decisions. Long-term adaptation strategies include things like investing in genetics, buildings, or equipment, or diversifying the farm. Making decisions about which adaptation strategies to implement requires data. Unfortunately, the data on future climate conditions is uncertain, and that can make decisions on whether to invest in long-term strategies more complicated as farmers weigh the cost of investing against the potential benefits. Farmers are always looking for ways to, to cut their costs and ensure their profitability, and this would be no different than any other kind of technology that they would sit down and say, okay, uh, I'm losing X number of sows that we're gonna to attribute to heat stress. 
and that's costing me Y dollars per year. If I put some kind of mitigation strategy in, whether it's a geothermal or whether it's just air source heat pump or something, and that system's gonna cost me X, and it's gonna cost me so much to manage it and keep it operating, and they'll do the math and say, it'll pay back in 35 years, not, nah, I'll wear the cost of the, the lost sows. Uh, if it's gonna pay back in three or four or whatever their break point is, they'll say, yeah, we'll have a go at it and then technology will get better and it will pay back quicker. The farm audit begins with farm inputs. We will look at ways to reduce the exposure of these farm inputs to the risk of climate uncertainty. These inputs include water, feed, energy, young stock shipped onto the farm, and other farm supplies. Climate adaptation is also referred to as building of climate resilience reducing climate vulnerability, or reducing climate risks. Reducing climate risks for the important farm inputs of feed and water will mean something different to farmers who grow their own feed versus those who purchase feed. It means something different for farmers who pump water from an aquifer than it does for those who get it from a river sourced by snowmelt. It may also be of greater concern for some than others, depending on local climate trends or climate projections. Many farmers are already adapting their feed systems to become more resilient. They are making changes in crop rotations, crop genetics, or in forage and pasture management. I think that what is probably helping to reduce the effects of these changes are the way that we're managing the, the animals, managing the grazing. I'm using a planned grazing process where it's um, high density, short duration grazing. And so even when we get into those periods where we're having um, a summer, a drier summer, for instance, that we're able to get through that because of the planning process and because we're able to produce more forage. Because I know that there are gonna be times when maybe I am gonna have to sell animals if I don't have enough feed. In one of the most critical points is to manage stocking rates to match the pasture availability in, in natural grazing systems. If you don't do that, you end up overgrazing and you get longer term degradation so that you get damage to the environment. And that's not um, helpful to the farmers in the long term in terms of um, income, but it's also not helpful to the environment. So the recommendations that um, we can make are to manage in advance for your stocking numbers, the number of animals that you hold relative to feed, to feed early, so to, to down stock early and to feed early. Um, that's not, you know, that's easy to say, but it's not easy to do in terms of um, feed costs and the um, capacity to offload animals. But that's the first recommendation. The second um, recommendation is to to look to the future at how you can improve your grazing systems to be more drought tolerant in the species that you might sow into your pastures. So those who can be proactive and get up on the early side of the drought and have that flexibility in their system to make management decisions ahead of time before that drought really becomes an economic uh, devastation to the enterprise. A lot of ways that uh, individual producers try to prepare themselves better for drought is to improve the monitoring on, on their farm. If we can uh, improve soil health, improve organic matter in the soils, they turn out to be more resilient to extremes, both extremely wet conditions and extremely dry conditions. And so soil health is going to be a key part of our strategy going forward. Genetics is another important strategy. Um, we've seen improvements in the crops that we've grown over time, and that's resulted in improved productivity, but it also has resulted in crops being more resilient to things like drought. And so the crops we have today that we're working with, the soybean and corn crop in particular, is a stronger crop with stronger root systems, deeper root systems, and, and those plants are more likely to withstand drought than even the crops we had 20 years ago. One farm in South Dakota recently made news headlines with its comprehensive adaptation strategy to survive drought. This five-point strategy involved adding more forage reserve, both standing and stored. 
managed grazing to build resilience in soils and grasses, storing more hay to supplement forage, monitoring rainfall and soil moisture, adjusting animal numbers after anticipating the future forage supply. Other short-term adaptations for farm inputs in areas prone to drought might include more efficient crop irrigation or planting drought-tolerant crops, better soil management to enhance water retention, additional capacity in stock tanks or farm ponds, integrated pest management programs, since climate change can cause new disease and weed problems for crops, additional feed suppliers or more feed storage on the farm, multiple suppliers of young stock. Increasing the farm building's resilience may require additional fuel storage or additional backup electrical generation if the farm's energy supply, fuels, or electricity are vulnerable. Long-term adaptation strategies for farm inputs should also be considered. Ensuring an adequate feed supply might require more extensive pasture or rangeland improvements. It may require changing crops or tillage to better match climate conditions. Water security may mean drilling new wells, installing new irrigation systems, expanding farm ponds, or purchasing water rights. Long-term adaptation might even include moving animals to other geographic regions with a better water supply. The animal production phase of the farm operation is also quite vulnerable to climate changes. Often, this vulnerability might show up in the form of heat stress on the animals. Heat stress may impact production and reproduction and can also increase the risk of diseases and other animal health concerns. Short-term adaptation strategies to prevent heat stress in animal production should include more monitoring and better management of existing systems, making sure the ventilation system is working properly, adjusting temperature set points, monitoring animal behavior for signs of heat stress, making sure animal cooling systems are operational in the early spring and late fall, improved protocols for feeding in hot and cold weather, adding more watering locations, shade structures, or other heat abatement systems. Many of the short-term adaptation strategies for heat stress just described are already deployed on most farms. Proper cooling requires protection from the sun with either shading or building followed by good air exchanges in any buildings and adequate air speed across the animals. Proper cooling also includes misting systems or soaker systems for animals that lose heat through evaporative cooling. It is also important to focus cooling strategies on areas such as the holding areas in dairies or wherever animal density is greatest. Farmers and animal production experts can describe the many benefits of implementing these short-term adaptation strategies for heat stress. I would say spray cooling is probably the most common. One of the advantages of it, especially in loose housing where cows are feeding at a common feed area, is that's where the spray cooling would be. It would soak them, and usually it's a, a cycle of anywhere from five to ten minutes. They'd soak them for one to two minutes and then it would evaporate for the rest of the period. For our sow farms, we have a cool cell system, which essentially is filter, it's a filter before the air comes into the barn and cool water comes down to it. We can drop temperatures about 10 degrees at best from outside temperature. So for grill finishing, we're naturally ventilated, which we're, we're counting on the wind. We're counting on outside temperature. We do have a mister system to replicate sweating for pigs. That won't go on until about 85 degrees and we turn it on for about 10 minutes and then we turn it off for about 20 minutes or as long as it takes to evaporate everything so you don't soak the pigs the whole time. They'll stand up and try to get more airflow across them so you'll see a lot more animals standing. Uh, rumination will actually go down. Uh, you'll actually get a decrease in activity so even though they're standing they won't be walking around as much. They'll try to stand in one spot. Uh, and so all of these behavioral changes, not only can you pick them up and they have economic losses to the farm from a production standpoint, but with some of the technologies that we have today, we can identify these behavioral changes and then hopefully go in and, and make changes at the farm level to, to cool the animal or alleviate some of that stress. If I can pick up that this animal is starting to become heat stress and I can find out when that is and start cooling at that time point or wherever that is on the farm, then I 
once I'm visually able to see a cow open mouth panting and saliva, the heat stress has occurred. The damage is done, right? So I want to be able to go in and, and try to start cooling and prevent that animal from getting elevated temperature and prevent her going in stress. Because once you can visually see it, most of the time, milk production and the other switches physiologically have already occurred. And so um, that's some of the challenges is trying to identify heat stress before it happens. I think the other thing is, um, and I run into this a fair amount, people that have a lot of cooling put in, but they get so busy. There's so many things going on come into spring with farming and, and, and school activities, to, you name it. And so I'll go to a farm that has a ton of cooling technology, but they didn't clean the fans, and, or a third of the fans aren't working. And the shades on the side of the barn, half of them are still up because they forgot to pull them down to allow the airflow to come through. Or, you, you know, you look at the nozzle heads on the sprayers and, uh, you know, a third of those aren't working. So, I, you know, I encourage the guys, make sure and just do a, a heat stress audit on your farm. Make sure everything's working, everything's clean, your nozzles are working and stuff well before summer hits. Don't wait till summer hits to go out there and start making the changes because once this animal experiences heat stress, again, talking about damaging the eggs and you'll see the effects for a month and a half, two months, once the heat stress occurs, it's, it's hard to recover from that, so catch it before the heat stress occurs and cooling those animals at the very beginning, well before summer. Keep in mind, animals are comfortable at about 40 degrees. Lactating dairy cows are about 40 degrees. A lot of our farms, the calves are raised in hutches, and we've had some challenges just of the hutches getting too warm, so making some of those adaptations where we can lift up the back end of the hutch or We've had farms where they've cut out the back of the hutch completely and put a hog panel in there just to increase the airflow. Long-term adaptation strategies for animal production can include continual planning and large-scale investments in animal genetics, farm buildings, and pasture systems. As one example, dairy farms in the Midwest are moving away from naturally ventilated barns to mechanically ventilated barns which give animal producers better control over the environmental conditions inside the barn. When we originally built these barns, they were to be naturally ventilated barns, but we didn't do it right. We built them in a little bit of a valley instead of on top of a hill where you get the nice breezes, and they aren't really tall enough. You need at least a 16-foot sidewall. These are only 12, so we were having problems with cows and the weather like we've had this past week, the, they'd bomb, they'd just drop seven pounds of milk in two days because they just weren't eating anymore. They were just fighting the hot weather. And so I went out to South Dakota and looked at the cross-ventilated barns that were going in out there and I said, well, this is how we can salvage these barns and continue to use them. So we made them cross-ventilated barns. Uh, when we put the cross-ventilation system in there, uh, the soaker lines were controlled by a thermostat and they, did, they just never came on again so we don't use the soaker lines anymore. We just depend upon the, the air movement through the barns to, to keep the cattle comfortable. I knew what it cost us to cross, to cross ventilate these two barns, knew what kind of milk uh, we were getting out of these cows and according to my calculations it was paid for in about a year and a half. Geothermal cooling systems like this one in western Minnesota are also being considered by some producers as a viable long-term investment for animal cooling. The real problem primarily from production or environment or weather is summer and we can get very warm uh, temperatures especially this part of Minnesota so providing some way to provide cooling uh, like a geothermal system is um, I think things that we'll start to see uh, being investigated more. And in this particular case, they, they decided to invest in, in these facilities on a more permanent basis just because of um, their, uh, their business model that they're using here, which is, 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 is different than, than you, you're going to see in most production facilities. This is a 900 sow uh, facility, uh, feral to nursery site. They're incorporating the geothermal system, and I think which is reasonable uh, in, in, a, in a production system like this. Um, it, it has to be integrated properly into the ventilation system. And um, 
the the system basically has to be probably sized to provide uh, sufficient cooling uh, that uh, that you can also but still properly ventilate the facility. Even though you can't see them, uh, uh, there are 360 uh, wells that are uh, approximately 220 feet deep, kind of all around this uh, first facility. Um, there, uh, you can see each one of these uh, little openings or, or uh, inlets on the side of the uh, of the building. Uh, each one of those, uh, so there are 36 wells that service uh, one of those uh, openings and that acts as the inlet and, and thus the uh, way that they temper the incoming air. So the investment made is, is kind of, uh, can be thought of as controlling some of the risk, preventing some of the, uh, the catastrophic losses that might occur uh, from real extreme heat conditions which which would not only result in loss of gain or production, but might result in mortalities. Producers are also making long-term investments in animal genetics, developing breeds that are more adaptable to future climate conditions. The other thing that farmers are, are managing to do is to choose breeds more carefully that um, respond better to drier, hotter conditions. A recent study of breed allocation in Texas beef cattle showed that heat-tolerant breeds such as Brahmin are growing more prevalent in the warmer parts of Texas. Another category of farm operation that is vulnerable to climate change is farm logistics. This category covers a wide range of farm management practices, planning decisions, and technologies. In the short term, there are many strategies to consider to reduce the vulnerability of farm logistics to climate events. These include being prepared with backup power for critical functions around the farm, forming emergency response plans in case of extreme weather events, making sure ventilation and cooling systems are ready early and late in the season, storing additional feed for times of drought or flooding, Developing plans for transporting animals in extreme heat. Planning for the transporting of supplies into the farm or exporting off the farm when there is flooding. Planning ahead for managing animals in extreme cold or blizzard conditions. Building resiliency into the manure management system. Really, your manure storage is something that you should be managing all the time. You know, do you have a field that it is appropriate to apply it? Um, is there a period of time when you need to apply it in pre preparation for a period that you can't apply? Mm -hmm. And so no matter how big your storage is, even if you have a one-year storage or more, you really need to be looking all the time for appropriate places to apply it and keep managing it. Building resilience into the manure storage system also means setting aside higher, drier ground for manure application or managing the manure storage so there is room in case of an unexpected large rainfall event. A producer with a 5,000 head beef feedlot in southwest Minnesota had given up on fighting the weather and decided to move most of his animals into a barn with slatted floors and a deep pit for manure storage. He determined that the added investment was profitable in the long run based on labor costs and animal performance. The final phase of the farm operation affected by climate change is farm exports. Unfortunately, farmers do not have much control over the market prices for their products. Natural economic cycles of supply and demand, as well as local and national economics, all play a role and are all impacted by climate and weather. In the short term, practices such as contracting for farm products is common. Farmers also participate in insurance programs to protect against farm losses. These tools may become more important in the future, and they may evolve as a result of climate and weather changes. Many farms are already more diversified in products, vertically integrated, or have farms in several geographic locations to hedge against climate uncertainty. Unfortunately, there is no simple way to determine the long-term benefits of some adaptation strategies due to the uncertainty of future weather events and of future climate impacts on the farm. For instance, it's likely animal scientists do not yet completely understand the full impact of heat stress on dairy cows, 
So how can one possibly quantify potential damage from heat stress and weigh that against the potential benefit of a heat abatement system? Long-term adaptation strategies are also more challenging as these investment decisions must take into account economic outlooks that project 15, 20, or 30 years in the future. Climate predictions are uncertain, as are population numbers, consumer demands, and global markets. Because of the uncertainty involved in making these long-term investment decisions, farmers should consult with a team of experts in a variety of fields that look at all aspects of a farm's operation. These decisions may require knowledge of farm finances, management structure, equipment and facilities, as well as consideration of a farm's long-term goals. Experts can help farmers look at options and weigh the costs and benefits. I do some transition planning and then some of the long-term planning, but I've noticed as we're doing more building plan, herd expansion plans, people are figuring out, all right, we need to have we need to have the electricity coming into the farm to run these fans. And, you know, maybe this year we can't afford fans and sprinklers, but what systems should we be putting in the new barns? So what needs to be uh, considered uh, when you're looking at capital investment analysis will be what is going to be the impacts to yields, uh, anything to do with returns. It could be price, it could be the quality of the product, and how that does impact the, the, the returns. Then also is how uh, it impacts costs. What are the changes to cost structure? Does it increase, decrease the amount? Does this price change? And then what we're looking at is the deltas between the before and after effects of climate change, for example, in this situation. When you're talking about climate change, we're talking about 25 to 30, 45 years into the future, uh, which is very difficult to, to predict. With other capital investment analyses, we might be looking at anywhere from 5 to 10 to 15, 20 years. And so you have a lot, lot less uh, time uh, as far as um, uh, risk involved and so um, that's the main differences but as far as the the, the procedures the uh, analyses that you do it's the same in this video we tried to provide some examples of adaptation strategies or ways to become more resilient to climate impacts in addition, we introduced you to a strategy or framework to help think about the many adaptation options there is no one size fits all Adaptation plans must be based on regional climate trends and specific farm impacts. Conducting a climate audit using categories of farm inputs, animal production, logistics, and farm exports may be helpful. Listing the likely impacts followed by adaptation options is also useful. Once this list is developed, the cost and benefits can be evaluated and decisions made. Nothing about adaptation planning is easy, but it is important. Thanks for watching.